Joining me on this episode of the Neil Wilkins podcast is the founder and CEO of BizHack Academy, Mr. Dan Gretsch. Now, Dan is all about helping businesses grow without losing their soul in the process. And I love that phrase. Uh, Dan's journey has given him some really great insights and stories on everything from AI and marketing to navigating the metaverse and also making marketing more sustainable. Dan is a self-confessed storyteller. And I would say actually probably master storyteller and we're going to hear a lot more about that as we get into this conversation welcome dan thank you so much neil it's a pleasure to be here i mean that is a big kind of build up here isn't it really i mean there's a lot of accolades there you know master storyteller you know person who's at the cutting edge of you know the evolution of this new wave of marketing and also being purpose driven it's kind of driven by the right kinds of things not just purely financial success i mean where to begin when there are so many exciting facets to both dan BizHack Academy, and also the kind of the right way to do marketing. Where would you naturally begin a conversation like this? Yeah, um, I think first a little bit of a definition of terms because storytelling, you know, one of the oldest arts can mean a lot of things, but I I have a very particular meaning for it um, and that'll provide a lot of context uh, to what we're going to talk about. So when I talk about storytelling in the context uh, of marketing, um, I specifically am thinking about it in terms of telling your business story. Uh, and the, the business story has really two components. One is the founder's story, the origin story. Um, why was the company started? And then the second uh, is the core purpose, the, the, the ways in which or the way in which the business is making the world a better place. So the origin story is really about the founder or founders and, and, and what was the founder trying to accomplish or why um, did they start the company? What is their highly personal motivation for doing this? And often that story actually has its foundations in uh, before they graduated from, from high school. Um, so they are, they were still, you know, uh, adolescents and they were, uh, and these were lessons that they, uh, you know, were imprinted on them, both positive and negative, um, by their family or their life circumstances. And, uh, almost every business, uh, particularly small businesses, um, you can almost draw a straight line back to their upbringing and, and very few business owners really are fully in touch with that. And it's an essential part of telling the story of their business, which is an essential part uh, of building trust, which is the core thing you're trying to do with marketing. Um, and telling that story of, you know, we call it the story of me, the story of why you do what you do, you know, what are your personal motivations for doing it, are not just the foundation of marketing and sales, but also the foundation of leadership um, and, and the foundation really of the business. And so we talk about that sort of solid foundation of the story of me, but ultimately it's not just about you, right? Like, you know, as they say uh, in, in story brand and, and other methodologies, the hero is your client. So the other part of that is essential, which is the core purpose of the business. How does your work make the world a better place? Uh, another way I like to think about it is if you were to disappear, how would the world be worse off? And what is your unique contribution? And what are you trying to do um, that it will have an ultimate positive impact uh, on the world? And so that is also really important because you know increasingly, especially with younger folks, uh, at least here in the United States, um, companies, uh, individuals want to be aligned with the values of the company. Um, and they want to feel like they have a lot of choices in how they spend their money and they want to feel like their money is being well spent um, and that the the larger purpose and mission of the company is aligned with their values. Um, and the, the good news is um, most small businesses uh, that I work with have a, a, a mission and a purpose that is has a positive impact in the world. There are some businesses where it's really about raping and pillaging and you know making as much money on the backs of poor people and and doing terrible things in the world and 
Um, and I, you know, personally don't work with those companies, but the truth is it it's rare that I find the small business where that's the case, because almost by definition, small businesses are really filling a need in the community. And if there's a need that you're filling, then you have a purpose that you're fulfilling. I think it's wonderful, Dan, that you've you've kind of given those descriptions there without even starting to talk about product or service. It's it's all about the personal, isn't it, in this story that you're telling here. You know, you're crafting, and that's good, the quote that you said there is, how would the world be worse off if I was to disappear? And that's a real kind of heart-centered really core focus that takes you right back to that almost profound moment, which is like, why am I here? Actually, what is the true value? It it isn't the product I'm trying to sell you. It's not the service that I want you to buy. It's actually about the human. It's that human connection, isn't it? I mean, that is the heart of, you know, great storytelling and always has been, hasn't it? Absolutely. It's it's a human to human uh, you know, we talk about B2B and B2C, business to business, business to consumer, direct to consumer. Uh, we also talk a lot about tools. We're going to definitely be talking about AI and the metaverse and um, other ways that you can use to, to get to your audience more efficiently, more effectively. But in the end, it's a, marketing and sales is a human to human interaction. People buy from people they like and trust. And storytelling is our fastest way to getting to a place of liking and trusting someone. And AI tools or digital marketing are just intermediaries between a human to human interaction. And this is lost. I mean, just this very simple and frankly, very obvious point around customer acquisition is a human service, is a human activity is is often lost in, in a lot of the marketing conversation and marketing training that's out there. And so we, we try to stand at BizHack in, in kind of opposition to the tools-based or channels-based approach to marketing. You know, I need to be on LinkedIn. What is the fastest approach to that? Or, you know, I got to use ChatGPT. So how do I, how do I use it? And, and, And the real question is, I have an audience that I need to serve. How do I best articulate the way I'm going to serve them and really fulfill a need and then leverage tools like LinkedIn, channels like LinkedIn or tools like ChatGPT to, to, to serve them more efficiently, to, to message more effectively. And so we, we really ground all of our training and conversation in marketing uh, around, around these concepts. Now, the one thing I'll quickly share is obviously telling your story of me is really powerful, but it only represents about maximum 10% uh, of your marketing communications. It's, it's not like you're sitting there talking only about yourself. Uh, I don't want to give that impression, but that 10%, is probably the most important 10% in establishing the trust so that when you do talk about your product or service, you you know, people are much more likely to believe that you'll actually deliver on it. Mm, So that's kind of as almost if we were to build this out as layers of an onion, for example, this would be right at the center, wouldn't it? This would be that last kind of layer, but it's almost you you need to break into that core because it's always going to be there as you peel away all the other layers. Those are almost the, the commodity parts of the story that you can interchangeably use. And as channels come and go, you can make different decisions. But that thing that's always there, as you say, it's the origin story and it's kind of that real purpose and value that you're bringing those are the things that are right at the heart of it isn't it i suppose we we call it the the heart of things for a reason don't we it's it's kind of it really is there it's that heartbeat of everything that you do i mean do do you find that people get this and understand it because i think to to you and i it just seems so obvious and it it's just kind of so real and we can kind of believe this but do do you see a lot of people glazing over at that point thinking dan what what are you talking about I i don't i've got product to sell here it's, yeah. this, it's this number of dollars and you can get it from here. And well, what's the complication here? What's all this purpose thing? Is yeah. it really complicated? Well, people certainly make it complicated. You know, uh, there are two metaphors that I use. You know, you talk about peeling of the onion. I, uh, my, my two favorite metaphors to talk about the role that the business story plays in your overall business and marketing. Um, the first is the foundation, you know, that invisible foundation of a building. And we actually call it the lead building system. And we have six pillars that we build on top of that foundation of your business story. But that is the foundation of your business. It's a foundation of your marketing and selling. It's a foundation of your communications with all of your stakeholders. uh, And it's often therefore invisible, 
right? Because you do not see, when you look at a building, the foundation of the house, what you see is the roof and the walls and the windows, which are the channels and the audiences and the products. The second metaphor I like to use is a diamond. Uh, and I call it the communications diamond. And if you think about a diamond, there's the hard core of the diamond and then the facets that shine the light. And each of those facets are different audiences or channels, but the hard is that business story, the why you do what you do. And that's really helpful because I'm sure you've experienced this where, especially with a smaller business where it's like their uh, communications on Instagram and their communications and their on their uh, YouTube channel and their communications on their website are like written by different people and as if they were different companies. And I say, well, that's because you haven't really defined what your business story is and then trained everyone on your team to tell that story. Um, you want to make sure that you have, and it's very simple to do, but you want to have a, a really clearly defined uh, business story, a uh, story of me and, 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 and core purpose, and then make sure that whether you write it in 150 characters or across a blog or in a video, you're always calling on those values. Now, my experience is that small business, small, medium-sized businesses don't even attend to or value their story. And a lot of times I'll go to a small business website and it'll be depeopled where it'll say like about us and it won't even mention the founder. And I'm like, that is such a missed opportunity because so, so I have to convince people of this because I don't actually think this is a common practice and I don't think many businesses do a particularly good job at this, which is why, you know, I, I make, you know, I run a training academy for small businesses and it's why I'm in business uh, is because so few people actually seem to execute this at the level they can and should. Um, but we have so many good examples that we're encountering all the time uh, of businesses that do this really well. And we often feel really loyal to them and yet we don't apply these same best practices to our own business. Um, and um, the, the, the way that I, I like to, to, to think about it is as a small business, right, you, you don't have, you have much richer and well-heeled competitors with much larger budgets and much better known brands. And your product, chances are, is a me too product, a me too product, like somebody else has the exact same product and they're maybe just down the street. So then the question becomes, why go to you versus them, right? Um, and one of the answers would be, you know, we offer better customer service. That's a very typical answer. Uh, but so, so does everybody. Everybody says they offer that great customer service. Another one might be, well, we're the lower priced option. And, you know, as most business owners know, that's a, a recipe for disaster. You don't want to be the lower priced option. That's not why you want people to work with you. There aren't that many other options besides your personal motivation and story, because you, that is 100% unique to you. The values that come out of that are unique to you. It is an immediate differentiator. The, the founder of the company and the reason that she or he founded that company is an immediate differentiator that you can use uh, to uh, distinguish yourself in a very crowded marketplace. Mm. Yeah, and it's it's interesting, isn't it? I love that analogy of the the whole well, the example really of of the about us, and it and it never is about us. It's just this generic thing that's been copied from you know, maybe some template that the web designer actually used when they were actually creating the site, and it's just not personal. It's not added to. There's no kind of flavor there. And then, of course, everything becomes transactional rather than building the deeper relationship, which is the thing, obviously, that we want to be able to sustain over time. That's why we're trying to be in business here, yeah. to get the lifetime and, value from a customer. It's odd, though, isn't it, that so few people get that? Yeah, lifetime value is a relationship. And the foundation of a relationship is you know, liking and trusting someone and, and feeling like you and they are aligned. So, so Neil, let, let, let me, if you don't mind, um, you know, you've cultivated through your podcast and the great work that you do and the teaching that you do at Cambridge Marketing Academy, um, a large legion uh, of fans and followers um, who, who are like-hearted and, and like-minded. And I'm curious, um, and maybe you've already shared this in the podcast, but 
why why do you do it? Do you, do you have a sense for why this work is your life's work? Why you're willing to put so much time and effort into this when you know the there are probably are moments when you're like, oh my god, this is taking so much time. I'm not seeing the ROI. What what am I doing here? Do, do you have a a sense for why you do this? It's interesting because actually there's probably two parts that thank you, Dan, for asking the question. It's just lovely sometimes to get. Yeah, the microphone kind of pointed back in the direction of the host is lovely. So I appreciate that. I think in terms of the ROI, it's quite interesting because I think once you take the ROI out of the equation, exciting and interesting things happen. So for me on the podcast, I don't look to leverage the podcast at all. It is, it's, I guess you could call it, it's a little bit of philanthropy. It's a little bit of my time given back to engage with people like you to spread the, the good word of, you know, best practice and just really innovative ideas and just trying to move the whole game forward collectively as a marketing, entrepreneurial, business community, whatever you want to define it. So for me, it's just lovely being able to give back. Um, I'm in the fortunate position. I don't have to leverage the, the podcast, but I could, but I choose not to, which is lovely. The, the other bit as well is I think in terms of just the, the value added bit, is I think I've been very, very clear that um, almost a little bit of a marketing maverick in in a sense of I don't want to work from the old playbook. I want to be part of a small number of people, and I know this is going to resonate with you, Dan, who are kind of creating the new playbook, the the one that includes AI, the one that includes purpose-driven, the one that includes sustainability, the one that's actually looking beyond that to things like metaverse and, and beyond. And actually being part of that community that aren't necessarily the smartest marketers, but we're the Mm -hmm. most passionate. I can tell by the way that you talk, you've got that kind of that fire burning inside you that that's the kind of marketer you want to be. And so for me, that's kind of I think why this hooks in and resonates with so many people is because I'm just by doing this and not looking to leverage it. I'm tapping in and getting the people like you onto the podcast to be able to share a similar kind of story. So I think that's kind of where I'm coming from with this. Yeah. So um, do I have permission to turn the tables and ask you? Please do. Yeah, this is fun. I'm enjoying it. Yeah. (laughs) I I actually, I think we're going to get somewhere interesting and maybe a place that's a little new for your audience with you here. And I I don't know because I haven't listened. I've listened to many, but not your full um, set of podcasts. But what you just said is when you divorce an activity from a need and a requirement for it to be profit making amazing things happen because the alter- the alternative is if you're like agitating about making money off this thing it becomes apparent as the kind of the the melody floating over the notes that that's what you're up to uh, unless you're like a really good con artist and and so it, it ends up turning people off right so it has an almost opposite effect and you know everybody r- knows if you've ever tried to date that when you are desperate and lonely uh, you date in successfully and then unsuccessfully and then what i've always found is the second i like get my a girlfriend then suddenly like i have more dates and interests than i've ever had before it's it's sort of like by not wanting it is the best way to attract what you're looking for. And the, the the way that I've thought about this is just sort of a certain pure heartedness. If, if you just come with a attitude of giving, um, you're much more likely to get where you're wanting to go. You know, the, the uh, things take a lot longer than you expect, especially if you hurry. Mm. Do you, but do you I wanna, find you have to trust, do you have to trust that because that that's quite a leap of faith isn't it for a lot of people who kind of maybe they've been you know from childhood they've been almost trained or or told that you have to kind of set your target so it's almost like you set the sat nav and then you're on this pathway you work really hard you've got to leverage every opportunity make your connections and kind of you're almost playing by the rules here I think what you're saying is kind of just trust have faith and belief that if you're doing the right thing it'll work out anyway and I have two life experiences that reinforce this belief because I, I think most people hearing this are like, yeah, yeah, that makes sense to me, but <laughs> I need to make my revenue numbers because I have, you know, um, mouths to feed my own and those of my staff. And um, 
the only times I've ever gotten in trouble, uh, so to speak, or the only times I've ever failed in my business as a trainer is when I've gone into a presentation and oversold and really pushed too hard on something. And, and I don't get invited back. Nobody buys. It doesn't work. And I've had to learn that lesson the hard way because I payroll. So that's, that's one is I have a lot of evidence uh, in, in doing a lot of educational marketing that if you push too hard, it doesn't work. Uh, and the other side to that is uh, during COVID, I was running an in-person training academy and COVID shut everything down and I had to cancel every class I had. I had to give back all of the money and I, I was down to about two weeks, uh, uh, you know, in terms of cash flow. Um, I was staring down the, the you know, um, having to let go of my team, you know, having to stop paying myself. and. And I made a decision that I, if I was going to make it through, I was going to make it through with my team. And my team came to me and they said, Dan, um, what you know, which is marketing, digital marketing, is what the world needs right now. Like everybody has had to shut down and now they're going to a digital marketing space. We need to get out there and we need to share what we know. We need to do so without expectation, right? Because no, everybody's freaking out. N n none of the relief money was was there. Everybody was you know, in terrible distress. And so uh, two weeks after the shutdown in COVID, um, BizHack started a weekly free masterclass series on marketing that we have continued now um, in a series of free webinars that uh, are now going into our fourth year. Um, we've won multiple national awards for the work, but even more importantly, it attracted so much goodwill that the, the year of COVID, we doubled in revenue. And I never mm. asked for a thing. Um, it attracted the Miami-Dade County, which is where we're based, we're in Miami, and they're now the sponsor of it. So we actually get paid to put these on. And as you said, it attracted all of these good things, but it was, it was such a difficult decision to do that without charging for it, to do that without it being part of an upsell process, but rather, to really attack an audience need and to just come through. And it's funny, since COVID has opened up, I've been back out, like I was at a conference this past week and it is not infrequent where people will come up to me and just say, thank you. Thank you for the work you're doing. It is noticed and appreciated. I was invited to speak in Congress in December um, about small businesses and their needs. And, and uh, it's a long game, you know, and there've been ups and downs since then. We had another near death experience that I can talk about, but, but I, I think the, the the thing that I would say is I do believe it and I much prefer living my life with the purity of intention because I just feel better about it. It's just, it's so much harder to go out and, and, and to try to sell in a sometimes awkward environment than to go out and try to help with a pure heart. And so it's just, it's just really been transformative for me. I, I have a lot of, uh, bugaboos with our industry, a lot of pet peeves with uh, the educational marketing and the manipulative tactics and a lot of the growth hacks and a lot of what businesses, the marketers do and, and marketers recommend other businesses do that are just really divorced, I think, from the human to human kind of heart led approach that I advocate. And ultimately, you know, it's not the fastest path. You know, but it's not it's not the fastest path, but it is just the way you've defined it that I will come 100 percent behind you there, Dan, and say to everybody listening. Well, one, you've got to check the masterclasses out. There was one that I saw recently that you did. I think it was back in February, um, which was the, the journey of a keyword. And I just love that. That was that was just a brilliant, brilliant little take. And again, it's the storytelling coming through, isn't it? But it was just the wonderful little journey of a keyword through various sort of stages of its life, its value to you, but kind of what it can do for you. Um, at the same time, was how you can kind of work with it, coax it, nurture it, almost treat it as a little kind of baby that you're going to kind of you know breed into a you know sort of full-grown sort of adult keyword and it was it was just genius the way that was done so people listen to or put the 
uh, the links into the uh, description for this episode because you need to sign up for the uh, the masterclasses, everyone. They're really, really interesting, a different kind of take. But I just wanted to, again, just as you came, kind of gave me a little bit of a moment to, uh, you know, to share some ideas, I just wanted to say thank you for your pivoting, actually, within... Um, lockdown period because I think for a lot of people that was a real kind of watershed moment you were either sinking or you were swimming and I think you know it was for, for those who were meant to be swimming at that stage I think it was just such a an empowering moment and you clearly figured it out really quickly and I think that probably just I don't know gives people a lot of hope doesn't it really because the world needs this kind of attitude doesn't it right now I do I do think so and um I want to tell a little bit of a story about why I think I do this work and the way I do it. And then I want to invite you to share similar. So, you know, you shared with me kind of on a surface level, sort of some of your core values and why you do things the way you do them, you know, but you didn't share with me why you are built that way. And so I'll share with you, we're, we're very aligned in terms of our values, but my story of why I am the way I am is gonna be different than yours. And so I'll share mine and invite you to share yours. So I, um, my father's from Spain um, and uh, he came to the United States uh, as an immigrant uh, when Spain was still a very poor country, no college degree. Uh, he had fallen in love with my mother who's American uh, from Philadelphia. And she taught for 35 years in the Philadelphia public school system, art uh, to inner city students. So it was like an underdog subject to underdog students. On my father's side, it, it's all coaches. My grandfather was a coach in La Liga on my father's side, uh, the Spanish National League. On my mother's side, it was all teachers. My grandfather on my uh, mother's side was a school teacher at Central High School, the second oldest public high school in the United States. And so coaching and training has been, coaching and teaching has been just in my blood for multiple generations. And so when an opportunity came to start my own business, almost by some sort of multi-generational force of gravity, I was pulled into the coaching, training, consulting space. Now, the work I do as an entrepreneur and as a marketing trainer of small businesses looks very different on the face of it than being a soccer coach, a uh, professional soccer coach, or being an art teacher in inner city Philadelphia. But to me, it's all the same thing. And so I honor my grandfather's memory and their legacy in the work that I do. And it helped me during COVID and in later near-death experiences, just push on through and be resilient. And it also is a story I tell all the time to my clients, to my staff, to my um, prospects, because I think it helps them understand why I do the work I do and why I do it. Um, so Neil, I, I wonder, um, do you, first of all, now that you know that like little bit of story about me, what, first of all, mm -hmm. what emotions does that arise uh, in you? And then I would love to hear if, if, if there's any stories from your youth that you wanted to share about aligning, uh, why, why you do what you do. Mm. It's really interesting, actually, Dan, when you said you were talking there about the kind of the, the impact of ancestral roots and the threads that either come through in your DNA or in the behaviours that you saw from previous kind of family members. It's a really interesting thing. I mean, the very first thing I thought of was uh, my father, who's, who's no longer with us, but he was very much somebody, he was in business, um, but he was very much somebody who um, was always looking at kind of the technology behind things he was always fascinated by you know kind of radios how they work and he was in television and he was in you know a whole kind of a lot of tech products uh, spent a lot of his career working with Toshiba um, the Japanese firm and, and basically working in a whole range of different kind of roles with them and I guess every Friday evening when he used to come home because uh, he used to work away during the week he used to come home and he would always bring a new product that hadn't yet been released and I would always, you know, be waiting at the door for his arrival as a young boy, um, thinking, what's he brought home? And sometimes it would be a CCTV camera uh, before they were even a thing. Or it might be a really nice piece of, you know, hi-fi equipment or something like that back in the day when you couldn't actually take your whole music collection in the palm of your hand or in the pocket, you know, when these were actual products and items. And I can remember just being really fascinated by this emerging technology 
And that, I think, has really kind of set the scene for me that it's okay not to keep looking backwards, but actually looking forwards. And I think my whole mindset, my whole kind of way of living is almost helping others to face forwards and think, this is coming. Trust me, we've seen the cycles before. This is coming. This is now emerging. Pay attention. Look here. Let me hold your hand and guide you into this space because this is going to be a thing. Trust me, it's going to be a thing. Let's figure out how we can then embed it in what we're doing now to improve what we do. And I think for me, this whole idea of helping emerging marketing, so either marketers who are new to marketing, help them to emerge, um, and or things like sustainability and AI, help that to emerge as well. So I think in a very long-winded way, I think I can really thank my father for kind of pointing me in the forward-facing direction with new things that are coming. And, and for me, it's exciting. I can just feel kind of my heart beating slightly faster as I as I re retell this story because yeah, it's, it's kind of really part of me. And I think if we can all find what is it that mm -hmm. brings out that emotion and that passion, that's kind of where our purpose comes from, isn't it? Really from the core. Yeah. So it's a Friday evening and you're waiting for your dad to come home with the newest technology. That sounds a heck of a lot like dropping a podcast episode. Mm. And I wonder, do you... Have you ever connected that childhood experience on a Friday afternoon waiting for the latest and the greatest, the new technology and the uh, loving and the loving guide to introduce you to it, to the podcast and the effort around that? I just did two seconds earlier, Dan, as soon as you mentioned it. No, right? I've never made I've never made that connection. But th but there it is absolutely is so thank you for, for i would never have spotted that it is the uncertainty of you know meeting somebody brand new thinking okay i think they're going to be a great guest on paper or on screen they look like they're going to resonate but i don't really know so there's that uncertainty that excitement of how are we going to actually work here do we have the chemistry are we going to actually be able to get into a conversation? Because I don't script this. I had no idea with my guests. I mentioned this to you earlier before the um, the recording is that I, I don't script any of this. It's always going to be a conversation. So sometimes there's a danger this is not going to work. But that's the exciting part of it, isn't it? And, and what you are doing, whether you realize it or not, is you're recapturing that childhood excitement that your father gave you on a weekly basis. And, and it's sort of like, hey guys, check this out. And I, I don't quite know what it is or how it works, but I have a really great person here and we're gonna just explore this together. And we're gonna, we're gonna figure it out together. And it's interesting, right? Because now that you realize that you're honoring your father with every episode, it, you know, the, the stuff you talked about earlier, which is, you know, the desire to give and so forth, it, it just deep, more deeply, and first of all, explain why you're doing it. And it also made it more important that you continue to do it during those moments when you, your family, your, your business partners are, are asking you like, why, why are you doing this? And now, now you have a, an answer that's almost unimpeachable which is i'm doing this to honor my father and his memory and 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 i just can't not and and then you know you could ask yourself like what else am i doing that's aligned with that and you know it's funny because you know what he did which is you know bringing you know cutting edge electronics to his son and what you are doing which is doing a podcast for people on the west coast of the united states about marketing uh, are actually the same thing, but they don't look, no, no, it's, it's emotionally the same thing, but it's not uh, on the surface of it obvious. But, but what's interesting is how quickly you made those connections. What, once I, I didn't even like, I barely asked the question and this is like, I'm like getting, this is like my life's work. Like I love, I love these moments when you have someone who's open hearted and, and open minded and you just ask them a few questions and purpose driven if they're they have to be purpose driven because it otherwise they have convinced themselves that you know money or 
uh, status is going to get them something that's a hole inside of them. Um, and, and, and those are folks I can't really work with very well. But if they're doing it for other reasons, reasons that are related to like, they, they couldn't imagine themselves doing anything else. And frankly, most entrepreneurs find themselves in that bucket. It's such a gift to be able to just point out the thing that's been there the whole time. Mm, and that really is a gift. I, I have to say, Dan, that was quite a profound moment. I, I, if I occasionally on on this um, podcast, I've had the tables turned occasionally to, sort of towards me. And it's like, OK, bring it on. Come on, let's have some fun here. But I have to say that was the most profound moment I've had. I had not, even though I kind of know this stuff, I had not and probably never would have made that connection between those Friday evenings and actually what I'm doing here, 400 and whatever it is episodes in. And, and it is that calling. It is that kind of feeling. It's not just a thought. It's a feeling that I'm in the right place. I'm absolutely in that sweet spot. And that's why it just feels so easy. It's so driven. I look forward to each and every episode genuinely because it is just revisiting that emotion and time and time and time again. How hard, though, because, I mean, I would never probably, unless you challenged me there, Dan, I would never have probably spotted it. So how can others kind of, apart from obviously subscribing to BizHack Academy and all the various courses, there's number one, but how can people kind of begin to self-reflect like this? Because I'm a real reflector and I hadn't spotted it. So somebody yeah. who isn't quite as, you know, powered by that kind of reflection piece, where do you begin? Yeah. Um there's a very simple exercise that we teach in our classes um, that I actually learned when I was a journalist. So my early career, I spent 20 years uh, as a journalist, and, and I noticed that if I just keep asking the question why, I would get better and better answers. Why does that matter? Why is that important to you? Um, and it turns out that this is not like my individual discovery. Um, Toyota pioneered something called root cause analysis which was a series of a why chain, series of whys. Uh, Vern Harnish in the book Scaling Up uh, also talked about this, um, this exercise. So something that I kind of stumbled upon in my journalistic days and then started to use in my marketing training and consulting, it turns out is you know, a big part of business uh, and I had no idea. And it's, it's a series of questions around why. So why do you do this? Uh, why is it important? Why does it matter? So, um, you know, you started with, as most of us do on the surface level, where, which is, you know, um, I don't do this for an ROI. I do this because I want to help. And so I said, well, you know, and I want to introduce people, you know, to, to new technology and discover it together. And so, you know, why is that important? And you might say, well, you know, in order for us to be um, relevant uh, in, in marketing, we need to understand what the cutting edge and why is it important that we be um, understand the you know the cutting edge. Why is it important that we uh, keep up and and uh, through that series of why is that important and why does that matter to you? We would have gotten to your dad. Oftentimes, uh, like towards the like once I start to like really get like it's really critical uh, for people to understand cutting edge technology and how it applies to them. Um, and and then I would ask something like, well, why do you need to be the person? who's providing that to them. In other words, there's a million other people out there who could provide that. You've made it your life's mission to be that person, why? And then the last question is, well, who taught you to value that? Or what early life experience did you have that taught you to value that? And I would say about 50% of the people I do this with, it's a sad or negative story. So their life's mission is to, their business and, and their meaning is often founded on a trauma that they're trying to spend the rest of their life fixing. So uh, I'll give you an example of this, a, a very touching example. So I, um, and by the way, the way you get into this is just like looking for something that's a little curious or different or out of the, you know, someone producing 400 podcast episodes is a remarkable thing. So asking why you do it is a really um, kind of obvious question. Uh, so there is a, a very close friend of mine who runs a mosquito, uh, a pest control franchise, a, pe a, a, a franchise uh, of mosquito control for outdoor mosquito spraying. And I live in Miami. It's uh, mosquitoes are a scourge. They're here all year long. And like, I, I literally cannot think of a job I would want to do less than walking around outside and spraying for mosquitoes. 
So when I met this guy and he's lovely, I said to him, you know, why are you, of all the franchises you could have picked, why did you pick Mosquito, Outdoor Mosquito Control? And he said, you know, well, I wanted to be a business owner and I like the entrepreneurship and my dad was an entrepreneur and I wanted to be an entrepreneur and I was working in IT. I said, I know, I know, but you had a choice. You chose this one. Why? And he said, well, he started to tell the story of his dad. He said, well, my dad, um, his name was uh, Jose and he ran a home construction business with two partners. He was an immigrant from Cuba and uh, they would fix people's, fix and build people's homes. And, uh, and what, what, what happened? Well, at age six, I was supposed to inherit the business from my dad. I would go on, uh, to all the work sites growing up and worked on the business. And then at age 16, my dad suddenly and unexpectedly died and cut out my part of the business that I was supposed to inherit. And so at age 16, not only did I lose my dad, but I lost my, my life's work and my profession. And then I went into IT, but it never really scratched that entrepreneurial itch. And so then I started this pest control company. And I said, do you realize that you're doing the same work that your dad did? You're creating a home that is safe and comfortable for people to live in. And you just saw him like the blow landed. And it just, it's exactly with you. And then he said, you know, the franchise I run is called Mosquito Joe. My dad's name was Jose, but everyone knew him as Joe. These are not accidents, but they come as discoveries because we don't always fully understand why we do what we do. And it, I do feel like I have a special gift at this from all those years of being an investigative journalist. Um, and, and I invite everyone who's on here to have a conversation because it's very hard to see it unless someone else is like your mirror and have someone who you love and trust ask you with curiosity, why do you do what you do? Why does it matter to you? And who taught you to value that? Or what life experience before you went to college, before you turned 18, led you to value that? And you will find uh, a thread that will help you understand why you do what you do. And I think one of the things, I'm going to reflect this back onto you with the mirror here then, Dan, because one of the things I think that you are exceptional at, I mean, we've not known each other for very long here, and yet we've gone into some quite deep psychological places here, really kind of sort of intimate little moments here. Um, but one of the things that you are exceptional at, I mean, you're a very clear speaker, you're very eloquent, but you're an incredible active listener. You haven't missed a single detail of anything that I've said, either in the, the pre-show kind of uh, chat that we had or any of the little examples of the moments that I've shared here. You haven't missed a single detail. And I've been noting actually just mentally mm -hmm. the number of times you've replayed back stuff from earlier in the conversation. That's vital, though, isn't it, to do this? It's with real focus and being completely present. You can't do this and pay lip service to it, can you? You have to do this properly. No, and, you know, it's interesting because, you know, I, I don't, I may as well have, you know, ADHD. I, I don't have it, but I'm very distractible. Um, and it's gotten worse with the cell phone. But I have almost perfect recall for details of a story when I'm fully present and engaged. And it's it's incredible. Like a lot of times, like you, you got there actually very quickly. Like most people just stick at that surface level where you started and, and just can't, like they just, they it, it, it is almost impenetrable to get to that story of your father that you shared so eloquently. Um, so kudos to you for, for going there so quickly. A lot of folks don't. They just, they just don't know how to think in that way. Um, but one of the one of my my other you know gifts is that when I when I do these as a consultation, um, I'm often able to, in the moment, rearticulate the story like I did with you in a way that puts gives the same story with different language. Um, and I do that for two reasons. One, because it's quite remarkable to hear it reflected back at you. Um, and two, it gives you language that you can then transcribe and use for your business. So you've said it one way, I said it another way. Take those transcripts, use ChatGPT, because we got to talk about AI briefly, to smush them together into a nice little story. 
uh, and 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 now you have a piece of marketing content that I believe should be in every single uh, digital platform you have, whether it's your social media bios, uh, your about us uh, on on all of your social channel on all of your digital channels, and and and, and frankly should be a part you know, of, of, of every sales conversation, every hiring conversation, um, you, you should definitely feel like you're, you're telling this story often. It's probably the single most important piece of marketing content you have. Um, and so I hope that my re-articulation of it uh, gives you some more language that you can work from when you're sharpening this up. And uh, going to ChatGPT and AI, I mean, by definition, ChatGPT cannot create this story for you. But what it can do, which is so valuable, is help you tell that story in a more uh, concise and compelling way. And so uh, that's the role I see AI business owners really struggle with writing um, or don't have a good copywriter on hand, uh, maybe can't uh, afford uh, you know, to hire someone like me to help them with this. And so that is like having a really good conversation with someone who you like and trust, having them dig in, ask you why, telling you what they see, looking for that sort of thread from previous to 18, taking that transcript and then leveraging ChatGPT to get a write-up of it that feels um, honor, that feels like uh, accurate. And you know, all of what I've said to you kind of summarize in, in my bio as you know, Dan, uh, you know, is a third generation coach and teacher who honors the legacy of his grandparents in the work that he does, right? So in most bios, that's all you'll see. But um, I, I do make sure to tell this story as often as I can because it is so powerful. And I did ask you a question that you didn't answer, which is how did it make you feel? Um, knowing, well, let me tell you how you, knowing your story made me feel about you. Whereas that first answer you gave me was good and it actually established that we have similar core values. It didn't really click for me until you told the story uh, about your father. And what was interesting is I know now that the technology element of this and the future looking element of this is really important to you. Whereas for me, it's much more about accessibility and, and, and bringing to disadvantaged populations these, these tricks of the trade. So even though you and I share uh, similar values and we run relatively similar businesses, the flavor that you put on it, which is more tech focused and forward looking, and the, tech, the, the you know the the flavor I put on it, the spin I put in, which is more make it simpler and accessible, especially to you know women and BIPOC folks, um, is 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 a part of our specific. And so if you're really tech forward, Neil's your guy. If you're really um, you know, interested in just simplifying, I'm your guy. And, and, and that is the other benefit is as similar as we are, we're attacking this differently because of uh, and in alignment with our personal story. Mm. And I think the thing, again, just to to finally answer the question that you did say, and I completely forgot because I was reflecting back on my own story there. Um, but when you, when you asked the question, how did your story make me feel? Um, is that it was just I was drawn in by the human element of it, the fact that you're celebrating, you know, a number, well, third generation there, um, sort of of ancestral kind of um, influence and um, sort of form, if you like, and that to me, just that whole pure human. We can talk tech and AI and everything else. But as soon as you started talking there about the depth of the human element behind you. That I mean, honestly, you—that's you, unbreakable. I mean, that really is. That is the bit that kind of gets you here as much as it gets you here, and that's important. And I think for me, that was the big part of the story. Is like there's a real human here, no matter how much tech and GPT and stuff is helping. There's a human at the core of this, and that's the key. So yeah. It's uh, do you ever, do you ever feel like your dad is watching? He probably is now. Now he knows that's the part he's actually playing. I don't know. Maybe he was there sort of thinking he's going to get it at some point. At one one point, a guy called Dan's going to enter his life unbeknown to him and he's going to be on a podcast and he's going to hit it straight between the eyes and he'll get it then. Um, I think so. Possibly. Yes, I think yeah. so. Yeah. I think that there, there's something a little bit deeper there. Yeah, I think you're right. Joking aside, I think you're probably yeah. right. 
Yeah. Well, it, it's like we're we're playing at something bigger than just making a living and even even helping people, but we're kind of honoring our ancestry and, and living forward a legacy. Um, and mm -hmm. it's interesting, right? Because you know your dad was a a diverse and multifaceted man like this. He might not even remember these Friday afternoons, right? Uh, I'm sure he does, mm -hmm. but you know what I mean. Like what what we pull out of our childhood, uh, you know, are are, are so personal uh, and so specific, and those threads run through our whole lives, often invisibly. And it it is a, a particular joy to leverage almost 30 years. It looks simple what I'm doing, but it's really a product of 30 years of work. I have a master's degree in storytelling, and and it's just I. I have found such a joy of working with the entrepreneur, um, just like I loved working with the journalist, because these are passionate, purpose-driven people. Now, they don't always see themselves that way, but there are so many living than starting your own business, and most businesses fail. So if you're in business for more than a few years, um, you have a, a level of grit and perseverance that cannot just simply be explained by desire to have a freedom of schedule uh, or to make a, li a little bit more money or not have to have a boss. You know, there, there's something deeper there. And, and, and once you tap into that, it actually, I think, is an unlocking mechanism to growth. Uh, and, and it really helps um, helps you make sure that, you know, what the business you're building fits you. Mm. And I think that to, that to me, that's the core of it, isn't it? Like you say, you can make the choices as to whether or not you want to set up a mosquito franchise or whatever it happens to be, but actually coming from something that is actually heartfelt and purpose driven, that's the key because there'll be something within that that can actually pay the bills as much as actually, you know, fulfill your life's purpose. And that, of course, for all of us is the ultimate thing. And you know, we're going to have to do a lot of self-reflection, a lot of, you know, heartfelt kind of heartfelt exploration. And as you said um, earlier, Dan, you know, getting somebody who's a trusted ally, either your partner or a close friend or somebody who will just sit there, listen and then reflect back is is clearly a great starting point. But I think for me, what I would definitely want to be doing here, Dan, is is advocating, you know, the great work that you're doing, getting people along to uh, sort of watching some of these masterclasses and, and connecting with you. So is BizHack Academy the best place that they can connect with you? Yeah, th thank you so much for the honor of the invitation and your, you know, uh, generous um, interview. So bizhack.com, B-I-Z-H-A-C-K.com is our website where all of our offerings, uh, including the free masterclasses, can be found. If you want to specifically go to the registration page for masterclasses, it's just bizhack.com slash MC for masterclass, MC. Um, and then at BizHack Academy on all the social platforms, uh, including on YouTube, where our recorded recordings of our masterclasses can be found. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Uh, I mean, honestly, Dan, it's just been... Well, surprising, enlightening, and and fascinating. Yeah, I've kind of certainly seen all of this in a very different light. And thank you so much as well for turning the microphone in my direction because it's always interesting. I think probably for the audience as well to think, who's that guy in the black t-shirt? What does he kind of <laughs> keep saying every time? I've listened to four hundred and twenty whatever it is episodes, and I still don't really know him. I know all his guests. So thank you, Dan, for turning the tables now it's been a really fascinating conversation and i would as i said earlier to everybody uh, i would certainly encourage you to get along and have a look at some of those uh, those master classes they are going to blow you away so dan thank you very much for all of your time and wisdom and uh, energy today thank you thank you neil and i'll leave you with a great quote uh david i say a public radio producer said that listening is an act of love that is just the most perfect ending to a podcast episode. Listening is an act of love. Thank you, Dan. Take care.